Let us now summarize the chief factors which enter into the development of an attractive personality, as follows. First, form the habit of interesting yourself in other people, and make it your business to find their good qualities and speak of them in terms of praise. Second, Develop the ability to speak with force and conviction, both in your ordinary conversational tones and before public gatherings, where you must use more volume. Third, clothe yourself in a style that is becoming to your physical build and the work in which you are engaged. Fourth, develop a positive character through the aid of the formula outlined in this lesson. Fifth, learn how to shake hands so that you express warmth of feeling and enthusiasm through this form of greeting. Sixth, attract other people to you by first attracting yourself to them. Seventh, remember that your only limitation within reason is the one which you set up in your own mind. These seven points cover the most important factors that enter into the development of an attractive personality. But it seems hardly necessary to suggest that such a personality will not develop of its own accord. It will develop if you submit yourself to the discipline herein described with a firm determination to transform yourself into the person that you would like to be. As I study this list of seven important factors that enter into the development of an attractive personality, I feel moved to direct your attention to the second and the fourth as being the most important. If you will cultivate those finer thoughts and feelings and actions out of which a positive character is built, and then learn to express yourself with force and conviction, you will have developed an attractive personality. For it will be seen that out of this attainment will come the other qualities here outlined. There is a great power of attraction back of the person who has a positive character, and this power expresses itself through unseen as well as visible sources. The moment you come within speaking distance of such a person, even though not a word is spoken, the influence of the unseen power within makes itself felt. Every shady transaction in which you engage, every negative thought that you think, and every destructive act in which you indulge destroys just so much of that subtle something within you that is known as character. There is full confession in the glances of our eyes, in our smiles, in salutations, in the grasp of the hands. His sin bedaubs him, mars all his good impression. Men know not why they do not trust him, but they do not trust him. His vice glasses his eye, demeans his cheek, pinches the nose, sets the mark of beast on the back of the head, and writes, O oh, fool, fool, on the forehead of a king. Emerson I would direct your attention now to the first of the seven factors that enter into the development of an attractive personality. You have observed that all through this lesson I have gone into lengthy detail to show the material advantages of being agreeable to other people. However, the biggest advantage of all lies not in the possibility of monetary or material gain which this habit offers, but in the beautifying effect that it has upon the character of all who practice it. Acquire the habit of making yourself agreeable, and you profit both materially and mentally. For you will never be as happy in any other way as you will be when you know that you are making others happy. Remove the chips from your shoulders and quit challenging men to engage you in useless arguments. Remove the smoked glasses through which you see what you believe to be the blueness of life, and behold the shining sunlight of friendliness in its stead. Throw away your hammer and quit knocking, for surely you must know that the big prizes of life go to the builders and not the destroyers. The man who builds a house is an artist. The man who tears it down is a junk man. If you are a person with a grievance, the world will listen to your vitriolic ravings, provided it does not see you coming. But if you are a person with a message of friendliness and optimism, it will listen because it wishes to do so. No person with a grievance can be also a person with an attractive personality. The art of being agreeable, just that one simple trait, is the very foundation of all successful salesmanship. I drive my automobile five miles into the outskirts of the city to purchase gasoline which I could procure within two blocks of my own garage. Because the man who runs the filling station is an artist. He makes it his business to be agreeable. I go there not because he has cheaper gasoline, but because I enjoy the vitalizing effect of his attractive personality. I buy my shoes at 50th Street and Broadway in New York 
not because I cannot find other good shoes at the same price, but for the reason that Mr. Cobb, the manager of that particular regal store, has an attractive personality. While he is fitting me with shoes, he makes it his business to talk to me on subjects which he knows to be close to my heart. I do my banking at the Harriman National Bank at 44th Street and 5th Avenue, not because there are not scores of other good banks much nearer my place of business, but for the reason that the tellers and the cashiers and the lobby detective and Mr. Harriman and all of the others with whom I come in contact make it their business to be agreeable. My account is small, but they receive me as though it were large. I greatly admire John D. Rockefeller, Jr., not because he is the son of one of the world's richest men, but for the better reason that he, too, has acquired the art of being agreeable. In the little city of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, lives M. T. Garvin, a very successful merchant whom I would travel hundreds of miles to visit, not because he is a wealthy merchant, but for the reason that he makes it his business to be agreeable. However, I have no doubt that his material success is closely related to this noble art of affability which he has acquired. I have in my vest pocket a Parker fountain pen, and my wife and children have pens of the same brand, not because there are not other good fountain pens, but for the reason that I have been attracted to George S. Parker on account of his habit of being agreeable. My wife takes the ladies' home journal, not because there are not other good magazines of a similar nature, but for the reason that we became attracted to the journal several years ago while Edward Bach was its editor, because he had acquired the art of being agreeable. O oh, ye struggling pilgrims who are searching for the rainbow's end, ye drawers of water and hewers of wood, tarry for a moment by the wayside and learn a lesson from the successful men and women who have succeeded because they acquired the art of being agreeable. You can win for a time through ruthlessness and stealth. You can garner in more of this world's goods than you will need by sheer force and shrewd strategy without taking the time or going to the trouble of being agreeable. But sooner or later you will come to that point in life at which you will feel the pangs of remorse and the emptiness of your well-filled purse. I never think of power and position and wealth that was attained by force without feeling very deeply the sentiment expressed by a man whose name I dare not mention as he stood at the tomb of Napoleon. A little while ago I stood by the grave of the old Napoleon, a magnificent tomb of gilt and gold, fit almost for a deity dead and gazed upon the sarcophagus of rare and nameless marble, where rest at last the ashes of that restless man. I leaned over the balustrade and thought about the career of the greatest soldier of the modern world. I saw him at Toulon. I saw him walking upon the banks of the Seine contemplating suicide. I saw him putting down the mob in the streets of Paris. I saw him at the head of the army in Italy. I saw him crossing the bridge at Lodi with the tricolor in his hand. I saw him in Egypt, in the shadows of the pyramids. I saw him conquer the Alps and mingle the eagles of France with the eagles of the crags. I saw him at Marengo, at Ulm, and at Austerlitz. I saw him in Russia, when the infantry of the snow and the cavalry of the wild blast scattered his legions like winter's withered leaves. I saw him at Leipzig, in defeat and disaster, driven by a million bayonets back upon Paris, clutched like a wild beast, banished to Elba, I saw him escape and retake an empire by the force of his genius. I saw him upon the frightful field of Waterloo, where chance and fate combined to wreck the fortunes of their former king. And I saw him at St. Helena, with his hands crossed behind him, gazing out upon the sad and solemn sea. I thought of the widows and orphans he had made, of the tears that had been shed for his glory, and of the only woman who ever loved him, pushed from his heart by the cold hand of ambition. And I said I would rather have been a French peasant and worn wooden shoes. I would rather have lived in a hut with a vine growing over the door and the grapes growing purple in the amorous kisses of the autumn sun. I would rather have been that poor peasant with my wife by my side knitting as the day died out of the sky, with my children upon my knees and their arms about me. I would rather have been this man and gone down to the tongueless silence of the dreamless dust than to have been that imperial personation of force and murder known as Napoleon the Great. I leave with you as a fitting climax for this lesson the thought of this deathless dissertation on a man who lived by the sword of force and died an ignominious death, an outcast in the eyes of his fellow men, 
a sword to the memory of civilization, a failure because he did not acquire the art of being agreeable, because he could not or would not subordinate self for the good of his followers.